Hi, and welcome to the Hopeless to Hotspot podcast. Uh, this is your host, Sandra Pullman of Glowing Place Speaking. Uh, I'm a city maker who specializes in the transformation of city areas that struggle with vacancy and decline. Therefore, some people call me the city flipper, and I think that's spot on. Uh, and I really love my job because uh, transforming places from hopeless to hotspot helps revitalize cities and villages, places we all need to nurture us and to feel at home. And in this podcast series, we're focusing on an expedition. We're investigating how we can transform struggling inner cities and station areas to the vibrant, mixed-use, beautiful places we long for in such a way that it brings opportunities, jobs, hope, inspiration, and a sense of community to the people in the city. And today we have a very special guest who will help us shed the light on an essential element in these endeavors for positive change and development. And can you guess what that is? What is that element? I'm talking about entrepreneurship and how to be a powerful catalyst for that so that many people in the city feel encouraged in their entrepreneurial endeavors, join forces and together create a movement that leads to astonishing results. So I'm going to introduce you to the best mentor I've ever held, had in this field, and that's Timothy Paulson. And I'm sure you're going to find out what makes him so extraordinary in the course of this podcast. So Timothy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sandra. I'm delighted to be with you. And when you're talking about the work you do, I mean, it's hopeless to hot spot. It's about transformation. It gets me excited, it, it, and, and, and I'm just delighted to be with you um, on this podcast. I have, you might see Sandra over my shoulder, Muhammad Ali. <laughs> Muhammad yeah. Ali. He's very yeah. famous all over the world, right, including the Netherlands and throughout the United States and so forth. And I love this quote. I painted this, by the way. We're going to talk about art because I love merging art with uh, entrepreneurship and art with with theology and all of these things in my life. But this quote, Muhammad Ali said, I am the greatest. <laughs> I said that before I knew I was. He started saying, I'm the greatest. And then he finally believed it. And, you know, when you talk about transformation, it's like you, Sandra, when you look at a, a hopeless area of, of a city, um, you see the greatness in it. You don't look at it as hopeless. You look at it like, oh my gosh, this is a great city. You say it before maybe even you can see it or believe it, but because you're saying it and you're moving forward, there's transformation that happens. And that's what I love as well. You know, personal transformation, entrepreneurship transformation, business transformation. So again, I'm delighted to be with you. Yeah, I'm delighted as well. It's such a joy. <laughs> and Timothy, maybe can you tell us a bit more about yourself? Yeah. I, oh, gosh, I love talking about myself. No, I'm, I'm kidding. You know what? Most important, I am Kay's husband. <laughs> we've, been married, we've been married almost well we're going we're in our 40th year of marriage we have five spectacular kids all grown married uh, uh almost 11 grandchildren and there will be more that's what's so uh, most important to me right is is the family and then um i think that that what drives me is that I want to help as many people as I can become everything God created them to be, to, to become their best. That's the work I'm doing now in the next 40 years, because I've been in the business world for 40 years. Earlier this year, I said, okay, I'm retiring from some aspects of that so that for the next 40 years, I'm going to merge art and entrepreneurship and theology to help people become everything they've been created to be. There's an old saying, Sandra, you've heard it, I'm sure. Um, I first heard it from Keith Cunningham, who wrote the book, 
um, what was a book he wrote? Oh, um, the, I know. Uh, the Road Less Stupid. Is that the, the one? Red, the Road Less Stupid. Right. Yeah. And so he was at this event, a Genius Network event, and he said, hell on earth would be meeting the person you could have become. Yeah. And when I heard that, I was like, wow, wow. I said, my purpose is to when you meet the person you could have become, you are that person. You've become that person. It's like you're looking in the mirror. Oh, my goodness. Not perfection. I'm not talking about perfection, but fully developing, going from the the areas of life where things are a little bit hopeless to hot spots, to turning the things that we're not doing so well into something that we're doing great. So that that's who I am. That's what drives me. I'm a second generation artist. So I love to use art and teaching and advancing uh, the things that I'm doing. Yeah, wonderful the way you put it. And uh, I think it's nice to tell how we met each other because yeah, yeah we know each other because uh, I'm a, I'm an elf member of Genius Network. And uh, for people who don't know Genius Network, that can happen if they're Dutch, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a network for high-profile entrepreneurs worldwide, yep. founded by Joe Polish. And you've built it up with him for over 20 years, right? I, I started working with Joe, helping him with, with his business in 2001. And on 2-22-22, you know, in the 21st year later, um, is when I, I retired from doing that. But yes, um, Joe Polish, very good friend of mine. I helped him develop Genius Network, a, a program even before Genius Network that led into it. Joe's a brilliant. And it was great working with him for all of these years because I met entrepreneurs from all around the world. Um, I, I started and then ran the ELF coaching program. ELF stands for Easy, Lucrative, and Fun. That's the coaching program. And when you are doing things in a business, entrepreneurship, that is easy, lucrative, and fun, it makes life much better. Yeah. It's, it's the opposite. And Joe advanced this. He said, uh, the opposite of ELF is a half business, H-A-L-F, which is hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating. Yeah. Who wants that? Who wants a half business? We want an elf business. So I was delighted a couple of years ago, Sandra, when you joined the elf coaching program and, and I was able to get to know you, to learn from you. You are a spectacular member of that program. Always showing up, always coming to give, always coming to learn, always coming to try to go to that next level and help others go to that next level. So, yeah, that's that's how we know each other. We've spent many, many hours together over the years in coaching sessions where I had the opportunity to, to work with you. Yeah, and it's been so delightful and it's a wonderful group and you, lead, you led it with so much enthusiasm and so much wisdom uh, still missing you there and but i'm still in the group because i love the people and i love uh, uh, improving transforming myself and um, developing and of course sharing and helping the other entrepreneurs as well yeah no, no they're from all, about, all around the world i love that too yeah you you um you practice what you preach You know, you 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 uh, you're not someone who says, "Okay, I've I've learned what I need to learn, and there's nothing more." I'm really smart, which you are, very talented and incredibly talented. Yes, you are, but boy, now I want to give. And to go to the higher highest levels, we need to be better givers. So even the fact that you're doing this podcast, um, you're giving. What can I do to give? What can I do to help others? So I believe that. So again, going back to I want I want to help people become everything that God created them to be. In order to do that, we've got to give, 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 because we can't get there without being givers. And you are a, a spectacular giver on so many different levels. 
Yeah, and I think and Sandra, if you if you'd like, I can repeat that in Dutch for your. No, I'm just kidding. I can't. <laughs> uh, you can say giver. It's gever. Oh, I like that. Say it one more time. Gever. Gever. Gever, yeah. <laughs> I just spoke that sort of. <laughs> you did it well. It was a good <laughs> Well, Timothy, you heard a lot of my stories about urban development. And do you see similarities between urban development and personal and business development? What comes to mind? I'm curious. Yeah, so so definitely. I mean, even starting with this quote by Muhammad Ali, it's right. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, um, there, there's so many similarities. You know, you asked that question, Sandra, and things are coming to my mind, you know, like like crazy. It's personal development is what helps entrepreneurs really go to the next level to, 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 to become so much better, so much more successful. So give you a couple of examples. Um, we've already mentioned Joe Polish. For those who don't know Joe Polish, um, he's one of the most well-connected entrepreneurs on the planet. I mean, if I wanted to talk to Richard Branson, Joe could arrange that. If I wanted to talk to whomever it is, he could arrange that because he knows them or he's very closely connected to someone who does know them, right? So Joe, Joe leads these groups. So Genius Network, there's a couple hundred members in Genius Network, and each member pays $25,000 every year to belong in that group. Then Joe has a group called the 100K Group. In America, that means $100,000. That's how much they pay to be in that group every year. And there's over 20 people in that group. Now, I'm telling you that. I'm kind of prefacing what, I'm, what I want to share with you to answer your question. That's where Joe is. Where was he before? He was not that hot spot. He was hopeless. Because as a teenager, first of all, his mother died when he was three or four years old. He was a drug addict when he was a, a teenager. He was dead broke. He, he, he started a business. It was carpet cleaning business. And could, it was struggling. He could not make a living. He was The electricity was shut off in his apartment. He was eating breakfast cereal three times a day. He couldn't afford anything else. How could a guy go from being a drug addict and dead broke carpet cleaner to being a wealthy, um, most well-connected, remarkable thought leader and a result leader in the world? How, how does that happen? Joe discovered personal development. He started to read good books by, by great authors in the entrepreneurial space. He met and learned of Gary Halbert, who was a great marketer, Dan Kennedy, who was a still is a remarkable marketer. And Joe started to learn personal development. He started to exercise. He started to take care of himself. And all of that transformed him mm -hmm. from hopeless to a marketing and entrepreneur hotspot. So it is the personal development. It's like, I, I've always been amazed by this, Sandra, and I'm an author of a couple of books too, so I understand this. An author, she spends a lifetime, whatever long that, however long that is, learning, right, developing. And then she takes a long time to write a book. And then it's printed. And then it's distributed. And I can get it in my, in my office. I can get it for $14. Think about that. She has spent her whole life accumulating knowledge, probably a year or two to write the book, to publish the book, to print the book, and then I can get it for a few dollars. It is mind-blowing when you think about it. That's why I have a library of books. I'm constantly <laughs> learning because I have so much to learn. So my, my point is um, to, to become a more successful entrepreneur is very similar to what you're doing. Personal development, it is recognizing within us things maybe that, that 
we don't really see. Sometimes, and you talk about collaboration and you talk about others helping us, like you come to the ELF program, Sandra, and you can see things that other members can't see in themselves. And so, so sometimes we need to see, boy, I've got it in me. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I'm an artist. I said that before I knew I was. I write a, I wrote a screenplay for this big screen. I'm a screenwriter. I said that before I knew I was. I'm a coach. I said that before I knew I was. It's important to see it within ourselves and then be around others who see it in us also. So, yeah, there's all sorts of similarities and parallels. Um, and, and I just I just love the fact that, again, what you're doing, I can look at what you're doing, Sandra, and I can say, OK, here's how this applies to entrepreneurship. This is what Sandra's doing. This is about turning an existing business around an existing business that is kind of hopeless. Mm-hmm. How do you turn that around? And again, a lot of times it starts with personal development. It starts like you're in an elf program because you're learning your about business and taking your business, making it more successful. Being in these environments where others can help you to, to do what you want to accomplish as well. And so in, in transforming a city, I don't, I don't picture Sandra going in there, you going in there all by yourself. You've got collaborators, you have, you have others that are help artists and, and individuals who, who have specialty, right? We do it together. And, and so that's, those are some of the similarities that I see. Yeah, I love it the way you put it. It's about doing it together and it's also about transformation. Yes. Personal transformation, transformation of a business, transformation of a city. It's all about that positive transformation and how do we accomplish that and how do we support each other reaching those goals? Absolutely. You know, another one, and you've met him, Andre Norman. I met him through Joe and Genius Network. He was he was he was a bad guy. He was hopeless. He was in prison doing, I don't know, you, you maybe 25, 30 years he was in prison. He was supposed to be in prison. I don't know, it was armed robbery and maybe attempted murder. I mean, this guy's a bad guy. Now he's the ambassador of hope. Yes. He spoke in, in the Netherlands not too long ago. I, I saw pictures of you with him and at Ilko de Boer's event. And, and now he speaks all over the world. He inspires people. He went from hopeless to Andre's a hot spot. He is. <laughs> he's hot he is. Spot. And he's such a great guy. <laughs> a great person. And he's there to give. I want to give. How can I support you? How can I help you? I'm there to give. So, so yeah, Andre, you take your very best transformation, Sandra, your, your hopeless to hot spot city, and you hold that up. That's what Joe Polish looks like. That's what Andre Norman looks like. That's how a lot of people look who, who understand that it's never completely hopeless. There's always, um, uh, there's always hope. Yeah, there's always hope. And there's so much room for improvement and development and creativity and all that stuff. Yeah. And what, what do you think about my line of work? What do you think about urban transformation? Oh, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you're not going to do some, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it is, it's inspiring. It's inspiring to me. Um, you know, I, I, I look at what you're doing and, and it's like, uh, I, I think of I think of some television shows here in the United States. There's one that's called um, what's it called? Um, I don't remember what it's called. It'll come to me in a second. Okay. A <laughs> but anyway, oh, it's called American Pickers. Pickers. Oh, I know. What you mean. Yeah. Oh, so so they go around. A picker is someone who's going to buy old things, right? They they go in barns all over the country and they they pick. Pick that means buy things and then put them back into circulation. And it's so inspiring to me when they can go and they can buy something that's been in a barn for 75 years and they bring it out and they dust it off and they shine it up and then they they put it back into circulation. 
And sometimes they'll visit cities on these on this television show, all run down old cities. But then you see they're starting to build it up again. There, there's and it's like, oh, my gosh, like an old theater, a movie theater that's 80 years old. Right. And somebody's restoring it. It's like, oh, my gosh, that is that is so beautiful. You don't want those. That, some want to come down and just tear everything down. Right. Don't do that. No, yeah. don't do that. <laughs> How can you transform it? And I was inspired by them. And really, this conversation, um, I, I, my wife and I, a year ago, were in a place called Heber, Utah. We were buying antiques. We're not pickers, but we like to look at antiques. And we were in a guy's barn, and we discovered in the corner, tucked away, he didn't want to sell it, but it was old 1947 truck, international, it's called. And he had it kind of partially covered. And so he said, hey, check this out. So I go over and there's no hood. It's dusty. He opens it up and there's bird feathers all around. There's been pigeons roosting in there and stuff. And it was just a mess. I got home and I was like, I want that. I want that because it was sitting in the barn for years. It didn't run. And so I texted him, hey, would you be interested in selling that? He was he was reluctant. He didn't want to. But finally, I was a little persistent. And finally he says, okay. Um, I would be willing to sell that to you. But then I hesitated, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes with, with another part of our discussion. But anyway, I got the, the truck and I had it towed. And within two days, they had it up and running. I cleaned it up. I love that truck. It inspires me. 75 years old. I recently drove it in a parade in Salt yes. Lake City, the biggest parade in the in the in the state each year. And um, so, so I look at that and I said, that, that truck could have stayed in that barn for the next 40 years, right? No, I brought it out and I'm sharing it with people. I write articles about that truck. I take pictures of that truck. I painted a picture of that truck. I may, I may even show it to you a little bit later. Yeah. And, and, and so, so, so what you're doing is what I've done with that truck, multiply by a thousand times the beauty that you're doing. I'm inspired by what you're doing. I love what you're doing. You're preserving things. You're making things better than they were. Think about that. And that's all, that's all wrapped up in what I'm trying to do in the world, make things better than they were. Right. Yeah. Right. Hopeless, hopeless to hot spot. So um, to answer your question, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's beautiful the way you put it. And then you were talking about the birth, uh, bird feathers. Yes. Uh, well, I think about uh, uh, so many times I've I visit abandoned buildings and uh, they've been abandoned for like 15 years. And I come in there and there are always birds. Uh, yeah, most mostly pigeons, and yeah. it's it's all covered in <laughs> yes. and they fly around, and there's all bird feathers. Yep. And I look, have a look at the building, and then I think, oh wow, this is such a beautiful place, so so characteristic, so unique. We have to yeah. do something with it, and then I fall in love with the building, the way you fell in love with the truck. <laughs> Can, can I, I've got a painting right here that I want to show. Oh, yeah, take it. Yeah. Yeah, because I can just go over here. I was in New Orleans several years ago, and I met this homeless guy. He was sitting there, and I thought, he's such a, he's a, he's, he's, he's a good-looking guy, kind of an older guy, gray beard and stuff. And then my wife and I and my daughter and her husband, who were with us, went to an art museum. And it was the New Orleans Museum of Art. And I walk in, we go into the Dutch room, Rembrandt and, and uh, Jans Levens. I don't say it the way you do it. Yeah, no. Jan Leven. And he painted a painting of, of a, an elder, elderly man with a beard. Elderly man with a beard. And I looked at that painting by Jan Leven who was uh, friends with, I guess they shared a studio, he shared studio space with Rembrandt for a time. But anyway, uh, have you heard of these names, Rembrandt? <laughs> Rembrandt I have, Jan Lieven, I don't know. Okay, I didn't either. 
But anyway, I looked at it, I joked with my wife and my daughter and my son. I said, hey, look at that. That's Dave. Now, Dave was the homeless man. So I've got it right here. Let me show you this. So here is Dave. He's got a University of Alabama knit hat on. Um, he's got the white beard. And when I got home, I said, I'm going to take a picture, or excuse me, I'm going to paint a picture of Dave, elder, elderly man with a beard. I'm going to put it in the, the, the most beautiful frame. So it's a, a gilded gold frame, right? And I'm going to honor him because if, if Dave's image was in the New, or New Orleans Museum of Art in the Dutch room, people would come in and say, oh, it's beautiful. Look at that. Look at that magnificent man. Mm -hmm. But because he's on the street, homeless, people ignore him. And so I titled this painting Homeless and Elegant. Mm -hmm. So what you just described, Sandra, in terms of going into a city or warehouse or something, people say, oh, my gosh, they look at it like people look at a homeless man. It's like, yes. oh, it's ugly, and it's oh, let's get it out of here. It's a stain to our city where you look at it and you see, oh, my goodness, look at the elegance. Look at the beauty. You can see things that others can't. And really, whatever you focus on expands. So you focus on what are the possibilities, where others focus on why is this so ugly? Why is this even here, right? So I try to do that with, with my art. I try to do that with personal development. I try to do that with when I'm dealing with people. Everybody's different. Everybody, nobody's the same. We all have issues. We're not perfect. Boy, let's focus on the elegance. Let's focus on the hot spot. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, and, and I think you already answered part of my question about my question is how do you become such a great catalyst and I think one of the reasons why you're such a great catalyst is because you see the beauty in everyone and you cherish everyone and you see the possibility possibilities for them to develop into in the future and you see what they want to achieve and yet you just see that in them and you you're going to stimulate them to get there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, you know, it comes back to, you know, because I merge art and theology, spirituality. I really love that. It's kind of my focus for the next 40 years. And when I look at every person as if they are a child of God, that's how I really like to look at people of, of eternal worth. It's like, oh, you know, when you have that perspective, It's like, okay, I, I need to, I need to uh, treat them, you know, treat them with that dignity and the respect, right? Mm. And, you know, leading with, I wrote a book um, 13, 14 years ago, 14 years ago, Love and Grow Rich. The subtitle is How to Love Your Way to Life's Riches. So it wasn't necessarily about making more money. It was about how to become more rich in relationships, how to become more rich in health and, and how to become more rich spiritually and intellectually and all of these types of things. Right. And so I have always tried to lead with love. I've tried So my audience, I'll give you an example. I, I spoke at a seminar in Egypt um, a number of years ago. I'd never been to Egypt before. It was a seminar. And then we had like 10 days of a tour, which was really fun. But I spoke at a two day seminar to start. And I wasn't the only speaker, but I was one of them. And I remember, and, and half the audience understood English. The other half didn't. It had to be translated, right? So I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. I started to get a little bit nervous. And I, and I usually don't. You know, when I'm speaking, I get excited. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. But there, I was nervous. I was off the stage. And I started to think, okay, gosh, I'm, I'm nervous start, you know, is this going to be successful? And then I just changed my thinking. And I asked myself, why do I love the people of this audience? 
asking ourselves good questions is very important. There's a Cameroon proverb, he or she who asketh the question cannot avoid the answer, meaning we're constantly asking ourselves questions. You ask yourself, Sandra, the question, how can I transform this into a hotspot? Others would say, how quickly can we tear this down? Right. So <laughs> the, 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 there's answers to it. Right? So, so why do I love the individuals of this audience? And then the answers started to come. And when I stepped on the stage, I was feeling so much love for the people that it took my nervousness away. And the audience responded. They could feel it because they could see it in my expression. They could sense it in my voice. They could, they could sense it in, in uh, the words I was saying and my presence. So we can change our state the way that we feel by asking ourselves the right questions. So let's go back to the ELF coaching program that, that you and I were both a part of that I led for a number of years. I loved everybody in that group. I loved everybody. And so when I was meeting every week when we came together, two weeks, three times a month, three or four times a month, whatever it was, I was excited to be with you. It's like there's Sandra from the Netherlands. I love Sandra. Or there's or there's Dave from Chicago or Arizona. And there's Nina from New Zealand and yes. Rafa from San Francisco. I, I was so excited to see you because I love you. And so to be an effective coach um, and, and to really connect with people, you know, it, it kind of, I think it starts with that. It's like, loving the people and wanting them to become everything that, that they've been created to be was really helpful. But you know what? Because I love you, Sandra, I paid attention. It's like, okay, Sandra's in the Netherlands. She's married. She has two beautiful children. Um, Fritz, I think, is 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Is that I'm trying to remember. Don't tell me. Um, is it Vera? Vera's 14 years old. I think her birthday's in November. You know, and I, I don't know how to pronounce your husband's name. Is it Joss or Jos or? Joss, but Joss is okay. Okay. Yes. So, so, so think about this. You come on to the Elf Coaching Program. If you're ignored, if I just say, wow, there's, there's 50 people on today. It's so nice to see all of you. Let's get to work. That's not nearly as good as saying, wow, I see Sandra in the Netherlands. Hey, how's Fritz? How's he doing? He had, he, he's 10 years old now. Right? Boy, it's like you're speaking in terms of my interest or, or your interest, right? I'm speaking in terms of your, I'm acknowledging you. And then we go to Nina in, in New Zealand. What time is it there in New Zealand? Oh, it's 5 a.m. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, and then you just go around the country. It, even though it took a few minutes to do that, acknowledging every person, I think, is critical. And I have been on a lot of, uh, uh, of sessions, Zoom sessions, education, because I'm in an educational program now. We have two Zoom sessions a, a week where I'm a participant, I'm a student, and then I'm in another group, you know, and, and sometimes there's no acknowledgement. It's like, okay, we're ready to get started. And it, it would be nice to be acknowledged. And it's easier to acknowledge when you have a love for the people. I, I want to jump in and talk about Fritz. You know, I want, you know, what's going on with Fritz these days? You know, those types of things. And introducing you to the other members. This is Sandra, and she she takes the city like from hopeless to, to, to hot spots. And everybody's going, wow, that you feel good about yourself. You're acknowledged. And, and we can have really great high self-esteem. We can feel very good about ourselves. Still nice to be acknowledged, isn't it? Of course. So that, that's, those are some of the things that I did. And then helping people understand the value of what we're talking about. Like you did a beautiful job starting this podcast. You're talking about the work you do and the work that I do. And people can understand, okay, this is going to be a really great conversation because they're going to be talking about things that apply to me. How do I become better? How do I become all God created me to be, you know, and so forth. So 
speaking in terms of their interest, you know, a lot of times it's tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. So this is what we're talking about. Then you talk about it. This is what we did talk about. And this is how it applies to you. You know, in the ELF sessions that we had, Sandra, that when I was involved, I ended uh, most sessions by saying, by asking each person, what's one word that describes your experience here today? And everybody, it just took a minute because it could take 25, 30, 35, 45, 50 people just two seconds each, you know, two minutes. How do you, how would you describe your experience today? Enlightening. Wow. Revolutionary. Brilliant. Fun. Interesting. Eye-opening. You know, so it was, it's always good to get most people, most coaches end a coaching session by saying, um, thank you for joining us. Um, we'll see you next time. Wow. Give everybody the spotlight for just a couple of seconds and then they just love they feel like they're part of it they're collaborating everybody's coming together if somebody says this was eye-opening that's a value to everybody else they start to think how was this eye-opening so anyway those are my thoughts (laughs) i'm almost speechless i mean you said so many secrets of being a genius catalyst. I mean, you've talked about acknowledging people. Yes. You talked about um, really tell people how it applies to them. Yep. And you talked about interaction to give uh, people the spotlight for a minute so that they can give their opinion or their view and people, they feel seen and they feel yeah, like they're really... Yeah, they're more engaged than when they only have to listen. And how often does that, is that the case? I mean, uh, what you describe, uh, our elf uh, coaching sessions were always so vibrant and so interactive. And I hardly see that anywhere. So it, I think that's very special. And there's another thing you do. I, I hope you can uh, talk about that as well, because you also challenge us. That's good. You you say, ah, you promised to do this. How about it? <laughs> yes. Accountability. Yeah. There's some accountability. When, when people know that when they show up, and you do it gently and lovingly, right? But, um, you know, you, you said that you're working on this. How's that going? You know, and if, well, I haven't got around to it yet. You would never, of course, beat them up. What you said you were going to do that and you didn't. Shame I no. No, 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 what, no. What what can we do to help you? You know, what what kind of support do you need would be a really good answer to give. Yeah. And and is that also something not to do? You you already gave an example. Don't uh, call them uh, names when they don't know uh, something, but are there other things you really should avoid? Things you should avoid in trying to inspire and coach. Um uh, well, it's pretty obvious, but you need to, you really need to exemplify the behavior that you want your, the others to show, right? So it's like, if, if I'm showing up late, Dan Sullivan, let me see if I can remember these there. He calls them the referability habits. Show up on time, do what you are, you say you're going to do. Say please and thank you. I think those are the referable referability habits. In other words, you do those things, the people are going to be talking about you elsewhere. So the opposite, show up late. Don't do what you say you're going to do. <laughs> you know? no, okay. and, and don't say thank you. Don't say please, right? So th- those are really good habits to think about. So, so think about that, Sandra. If you got on a call, an elf session, a coaching session with me, and, and it's like the clock's going and it's past the time, and it's like, wait, where is it? Oh, sorry, you know, I was on another call. Well, something else was more important, so I wasn't here, right? Yeah, and that's then, impossible. <laughs> and then I didn't do what I said I was going to do. So we would have, you know, it's like, okay, we would do a we would do an elf session, and then okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you um, 
the, the link to the recording of this session. And then I'm going to send you two tools, thinking tools that we spoke about today. And I'll get those to you by the end of the day. And um, I hope that I always did. But I think that's an example. You need to do what you say you're going to do. And that, that applies. I raised five kids. You have two beautiful children. Yours are still at home. Mine are, mine are gone. Now we've got the grandkids, as I mentioned earlier. You know, with your kids, show up. You know, show up. Um, do what you say you're going to do. Say please and thank you. And that's, that's wonderful as a parent, as a spouse, Gosh, if, if my wife couldn't rely on me, honey, I'm going to be home at this time and this is what we're going to do and, and I'm not there. It's mm -hmm. like no credibility, right? So if we want to be a catalyst as a coach or whatever, as a city planner, as whatever, transformation expert, whatever, show up on time, do what you say you're going to do, say please and thank you. Um, on the ELF and the coaching program, you know, when people said, you know, give, give me one word. And Sandra says, spectacular. Thank you, Sandra. And then we go on to the next person. So it's important, even though that's kind of subtle and most people wouldn't notice it, it's, it's important to, to add that. So thanks to Dan Sullivan for that idea. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'm going to explain why it's so important to me to, to, uh, to learn about this. It's because... When I when I'm working on a city, uh, of course I I'm not able to do anything by myself. Like right. you said before, right? Uh, I need many 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 people to join forces and to be inspired and to think, okay, this is worthwhile. I'm going to contribute to that. So. Uh, transforming a city is really about getting people involved uh, and inspire them to take action. Yes. And not just two people, not five people, but I mean, I have project groups that have like 30 people and cities are way bigger and you want to touch them all in a way. Yep. So that's why this is such an important thing for me to learn. And I learned a lot from you and I'm still uh, doing it. I mean, I'm not as good as you are at it, but I'm trying to be. <laughs> You're great. You're doing great. I love it. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, the development of cities, it's some, to some people, I think to many people, it's, it's like, uh, they think it's very technical and about procedures and about stones and about money, but that's only half of it. The important other half is, how to bring people into movement. And that, that you, you just hit it. You hit the nail right on the head. <laughs> that's, a, that's a Dutch term. Um, you just nailed it because anybody can get rocks and all of the, anybody can do that, but not everybody can get that collaboration, the right people working together, the right mix so that magic happens. And so that is a remarkable art and skill that, that you've developed remarkably. Yeah, thanks. And I'm still, get, still trying to get better at it. I mean, yeah, it's such an important part of my job. And I think that, uh, that in schools and in universities, people don't learn this. Not, they are not even uh, taught that it's important. They're not aware. So um, many people working in my industry, they only think about the stones and the money and stuff. Yeah. Yep. So okay. I think there's a lot of uh, uh, development in my field of work needed on this line of, uh, of work. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. How would you say this? Perrier. Perrier. <laughs> Another thing I know about you, Sandra, is you speak French and Dutch and English and German, and uh, and then you're learning Norwegian. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, wow. So, <laughs> I think you probably said it better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah that's, that's when you're in Europe, you have to learn a lot of language, um, languages because, well, not so many people speak Dutch. 
<laughs> and it's funny because I live in the Eindhoven region and there are many uh, international people that uh, live here. I think there are about 100 different nationalities that live in this region. Wow. And uh, they love it, but they also complain. They say, well, we are so terrible at Dutch because it's a difficult language. But also, all those Dutch people, they talk English. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to learn. <laughs> It makes it easier. Yeah, I talked to um, uh, a man from Brazil on the soccer field yesterday, and he said exactly these words. I'm here in uh, Eindhoven for four years, and my Dutch is terrible because I don't have to speak it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, a, a different topic. I really want to know uh, about this. In Genius Network, there's a lot of collaboration between entrepreneurs. Uh, I think some collabs are spontaneous uh, and many are encouraged by Genius Network. Why is co-creation so important in a great business network? Can you explain us? Uh, well, first of all, so, you know, being a part of Genius Network for so many years, I think that when, when Jill first started it, I was, I was startled by the level of entrepreneurs that were in the group, very high level, very high level entrepreneurs. And it's like, wait a second, they're already so successful. They could be leading the group themselves. Um, and some did, they led groups, right? They, they were coaches of other groups. What I've discovered over time is that the most successful people, they realize that they they need that. It, it's a, it is like it is like the lifeblood of their business of their life is to be able to collaborate with others. Um, so, in Genius Network, you're exactly right. It's strongly encouraged. As a matter of fact, you know we talk about Genius Network being about connecting, connecting with other high-level entrepreneurs, collaborating with other high-level entrepreneurs, collaboration, and then contribution, coming with an attitude of wanting to give. So when you have high-level entrepreneurs coming and saying, what can I do to help you? Let's collaborate. Let's connect. There's magic that happens. I mean, there's businesses that have been formed between members. They've collaborated. But, but mostly it's other people can see your business blind spots, you might say, in, in your view and in your experience and your perspective that you cannot see yourself. I am a very good business consultant. I can help people with their marketing and this and that um, strategy. When it comes to my own business, I don't see some things that are so obvious that I see in other people's business. There's, we're just too close to it. Mm -hmm. Myopic is a, is a very good way to put it. I'm very myopic, uh, clo close, uh, close sighted. You can't see the bigger picture. When I'm coming into somebody else's business, I can see the big picture, right? So my, I mentioned earlier, I'm a second generation artist. My dad has been a full-time professional artist. He's a painter. Um, since I was a little boy, I was raised, my dad, that's all he did. He didn't have another job. It was art, painting, and teaching art lessons, selling his work, uh, and so forth. He's taught me a lot. One of the things I love is, and this is, it seems so simple. And when I first heard about it, it didn't seem like that was going to make a difference. But my dad said, have a mirror. And I've got a mirror over at my studios right over here. My gallery is this way. <laughs> but I've got a, a, a mirror. And so I'm painting. And I think, okay, this looks really good. This is, this is exactly the way that I want it. If I take the mirror and I look at the painting, the reverse image, Sandra, I can see the flaws. Mm. It's like, oh, my gosh. Wait, that's not right. And this isn't right. It's so interesting that just with that change of perspective, you see it totally different. 
So collaborate is like the mirror is my collaborator. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Okay. How does it look? How's it look? So, oh my gosh, it looks, it, lo- it needs some work. And so the same thing happens in collaboration. So, you know, in a lot of the sessions that we were in Sandra together in the elf group, there's collaboration going on. I'd put you into breakout groups. You'd be with five or six other members and you would share ideas. You would collaborate on uh, some of the, the things that we're talking about, we cannot do it on our own. I, I years ago, if, if there's a big business mistake of mine, it was trying to do it myself. Mm-hmm. I can figure it out. I'm, I'm the guy. And that was a mistake. It was when I started to, to collaborate with others, seek for collaboration and join groups and lead groups, because I lead groups to help me collaborate. That's part of the benefit of leading groups. When I was leading the ELF coaching program, it was beneficial to me to hear you and others talk about what you were doing and bouncing ideas off. So the collaboration is key. Going back to um, Dan Sullivan, who's a brilliant business coach in the United States, for those who don't know, he leads a uh, strategic coach. And I've been a part of, as a member of strategic coach as well. But he and my friend Ben Hardy, Dr. Ben Hardy, they wrote a book together, Who, Not How. I love that. Yeah. And it's a great book, isn't it? And, and I so have. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's for too many years, Sandra, I just, I just tried to figure out how to do it myself. And, and still all of us, and Dan Sullivan says that he still does that too, you know, sometimes. So, you know, we all do it. But it's like not how, like, for example, this uh, this podcast, um, I'm not a technical person to do a video podcast, to get it edited and stuff. That'd be painful for me, but I can show up. You're you're you have your who's to be able to take care of all that stuff. I just show up and speak. Right. So um, who not how genius network is full of who's. So people go there, they collaborate, they meet someone who's a great copywriter. They can write a great marketing piece. Great. I found my who, as opposed to trying to learn to be a great copywriter for the next 10 years, right? Yeah, right. Um, which, which is fine if I, you know, because I, I've done that. I've learned to be a copywriter because I love doing it. But my point is shortcuts. Is shortcuts is to find who's to collaborate. So in, in the work you're doing, Sandra, yeah, I just um, pick, picture trying to do it all yourself. It would take 20 times longer. Yeah. It wouldn't be quite as good. It would be frustrating. Boy, just collaborate because everybody brings in different ideas. And here, here's something. I'll give you an example. My dad, when he was uh, in his 20s, he started taking art lessons and his art instructor was Claude Buck. Now, Claude Buck was a brilliant artist, once recognized as one of the uh, best living artists in the United States. He was he taught at Art Institute, brilliant artist, and he moved to Santa Barbara, California, about the time that my dad did in 1962. And my dad discovered him and said, hey, I'd like to take lessons. It's a longer story, but here's what I want to get to. My dad was a brand new artist. He was not an artist in college. He didn't take art classes in high school. He took one art class in junior high school, which means he was about 12 or 13 years old. And he got a D grade. Mm -hmm. It's almost, almost failing, right? So my dad is 28 years old. He had never painted before, had that one art class. He got a D. And at the age of 28, he meets Claude Buck. Claude Buck, one of the greatest living artists, um, had been an artist his whole life, taught on a very high level at, at institutes, 74 years old. So with that frame, I tell you the rest of the story. My dad was looking at a painting that Claude Buck did. My dad kind of laughed and said, you know what? This doesn't look right here. And Claude said, well, well, what do you mean? And my dad explained it. And then my dad, went, he was there for a lesson. My dad went home the next week when he came back for his lesson. Claude had changed that part mm-hmm. and, and made it better. And my point is this. What right does a 28-year-old who has never painted before have to correct a master artist 
was one of the greatest living artists in the United States. How could he? Claude was humble. He was teachable. And that's how my dad is, too. My dad's 88 years old today, still painting. He's still teaching. He's still healthy. He's doing great. He will ask his students, now that I've taught you this painting, what can I do better? And he's open. He's humble. So part of collaboration in my mind, Sandra, is being humble, being teachable. What can I, I don't care if this person's a brand new entrepreneur. She's going to see things that I don't see. And I want to hear what she has to say. Wow, that's beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, Thank you very much for saying it like that. Yeah. And, and, and also, I mean, the connection between people that, is, that comes from that. When you are humble, when you're open, that brings in uh, a lot of connection and a lot of fun as well. Yep. Uh, I, I've also done way too much by myself and wanted to do everything by myself. And since I've been more open up and joined groups and really looking for co-creation, my levels of fun have risen so much Fantastic. because it's, it brings joy when you, when you can work together with people and to, uh, to be able to say to each other, look what we did together. Yes. And wow, you did that. You did such a great job. And people say that to you as well. I mean, yeah, that's yep. that's good for the heart. There's an old saying, Sandra, and I, I don't know if I have it exactly right, but it's like something like it's amazing the things you can do, get done, accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit. Um, when I go into something, I said, OK, I want to get the credit for this. I, I'm the big dog. I'm I'm the guy. <laughs> um, it's it's there's less collaboration because it's like wait wait a second wait a second you want all of the credit people want the credit they want to be recognized as we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier there have been many environments that i've been in sandra where um we do a breakout group a collaboration or i'm just in a group and there are people who think that they are we say in the united states too cool for school They're, they're just smarter than everybody else. They're better than everybody else. They're more successful than everybody else. Yeah. Better looking than everybody else. And they really don't want to be humble and acknowledge others. They are, they are it. They're the it person, right? And they don't last in the group. I've seen it in Genius Network on rare occasion, but because most of them are very humble and they want to just mm -hmm. collaborate. But it's, it's those individuals who don't, who don't connect with the other people because it's like, I, why would I want to collaborate with that person? She or he thinks they know it all. Right. And, and um, they're, they're more interested in talking than listening, you know, and there's some value to learning from people like that. But in terms of collaboration, it's very difficult. Yeah. I always find it very beautiful the way that Joe puts it. Uh, um, life gives to the giver. And takes from the taker. Yep. I hear that in what you said as well. Yep, absolutely. Joe's new book, what's it called? Is it Life Gives to the Giver? I think that's the name of the book. Or no, that, that's... No, What's in it. it for Them is the newest what's book. What's in it for them, thank you. Yeah. So, so a book that he wrote a couple of years ago, Life Gives to the Giver. And the new one is What's in it for Them? Which And I've read the book, and it's a terrific book. It's going to be a classic book. It has great content. And, um, and that it kind of comes down to you know, collaboration. I'm a better collaborator when I'm focusing on what's in it for them. How can I help the other person? Yeah. And there's also a beautiful uh, quote by Joe. He says, uh, there's, there are no problems that can be solved with the right genius network. Yep. I love that one as well. I mean, there can be a challenge too big and we can reach it together. Yeah. Yep. I love that. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Yeah. I mean, it's like you can do anything in the world if you, if you find the right who's and we do it together. So if I wanted to go to Mars, I'd say, hey, Joe, can you connect me with Elon Musk? Yeah. And uh, Peter Diamandis. And so, you know, so, so there's ways it might be hard. It might be a difficult thing, but it's like, if that's where I want to go, then 
we need to collaborate with the right people. Yeah, right. <laughs> and just called world. you to connect us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and do you know, maybe, you know, great ways to uh, encourage co-creation? Um, great ways to encourage it. Um, uh, so what would the environment need to be for co-creation? I think, first of all, you know, Ben Hardy wrote the book, um, and, uh, Willpower doesn't work. That was his first book. Um, I met I met him in Genius Network a number of years ago. Willpower doesn't work, and he talks about um, environment. So it's not willpower. So in other words, if I uh, if I wanted to not eat junk food, but in my office there's junk food all around, <laughs> it's going to be hard not to eat junk food. Yeah. Um, if I don't want to eat junk food and there's no junk food in my environment at all, anywhere, I'm much more likely to be successful. So it's not about willpower. It's about environment. So when you ask that question, Sandra, I'm thinking, what would the environment be that would, that would encourage co-creation collaboration? And so, uh, if it was a coaching group, um, the coach would need to set that environment and encourage that environment. I think that whether it's in that environment or another, to encourage co-creation, collaboration. Uh, oh, I've got two other ideas that I want to share with you. One is in the United States, radio stations uh, have call letters, right? So um, west of the Mississippi, start with K, K-I-S-T. FM, right? Mm -hmm. On the east of the Mississippi is W, W, Q, S, R, whatever, right? So there's a radio station, W, I, I, F, M. And actually, it's an acronym for what's in it for them. So it's not really a radio station, but it's a way to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to encourage co-creation, what's in it for them? And, and why, why should I be involved in this? And it might be philanthropic. It might be you're going to help save the world. You're going to help um, um, people who don't have food to have food. People don't have drinking water. You know, it might be something yeah. like that. What's in it for them? You can be part of this big picture. But a lot of times it is. What's in it for them? You can take your business to the next level. You can become a more successful entrepreneur uh, or, or you can become more of what you're capable of becoming, personal development, these types of things. I think that when individuals understand what's in it for them, how am I going to benefit from, from co-creating, uh, collaborating, then, then I think that they're more likely to do it. Another thing, this, this is another thought that I think is important. <laughs> people who don't pay don't pay attention mm -hmm. so if there's a way like for example when you're in the elf coaching program you've paid you've invested a lot over the years to be in that group it's not inexpensive um, when you pay you pay attention you, you're more likely to show up if the elf coaching program was free there would be very few people showing up They don't have an investment. As we say, they don't have skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So when you show up, when you pay, you pay attention. So if you want co-creation, a payment, it doesn't have to be, it can be a payment of time, an investment of time. It can be an investment of money. It could be different types of investment. But when people pay, they're going to pay attention. They're going to be more interested. So environment. What's in it for them? If they pay, they'll pay attention. There might be something there that, that may answer your question. Yeah, lovely. And uh, there was actually a fourth that you mentioned, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, explain. Uh, paint a big picture of what you're reaching. That's good. Yeah, set the intention for what you can do together. Yeah, uh, yeah. Go to Mars or whatever. 
is also what gets people involved because they know I can do it by myself, but with this group, it becomes possible. Yes. Yeah. So I'm in a, an educational program presently at uh, Emory University. It's in Atlanta. It's a very fine university here. I'm in the School of Theology. I'm working on a Doctor of Ministry degree. So I'm in year two of this three-year program. And why, why am I there? Why, why do I show up twice a week? The environment, um, I pay, pay a lot of money to that doctoral <laughs> program. Um, I know what's in it for me, but the big picture is I want to, and I started a nonprofit organization earlier this year. It's called Totality Ministries. And totality is, you know, the moon in front of the sun with the corona around it. I love that image. I love how that represents or can represent. Let me show you. Yeah, do you have it there? <laughs> so well, I, I should have the book. Yeah, you have the painting. That's, that's yeah, even better. <laughs> Here's the painting. So I love what this represents. If you can look at that and say, okay, that represents personal totality, becoming everything that you're capable of becoming. So in my doctoral program and with the, the, the totality ministries, which is really my focus for the next 40 years, merging art and theology and entrepreneurship, um, it's, uh, that's why I'm in this educational program, to collaborate with really smart leaders of various different faith groups and with terrific professors, because the purpose of Totality Ministries is to help people become all God created them to be. That's one. And also to help create unity and friendship and love between individuals of all races, of all uh, of all denominations or or lack of denomination, I'm looking for unity. So, so what encourages encourages me to co-create? Again, that environment, Emory University, right? What's in it for them? What's in it for me? I'm going to be able to to move forward with some of these. The big picture, helping to to unity, friendship, and love throughout the world, but help people become all that God created them to be. Um, those things, you know, it all it all ties in and the investment, um, you know, so again, you know, when you pay, you pay attention. I'm paying really good attention in this educational program and I don't, I don't have to get a doctorate. I want to. This is something that that I'm doing because um, because of the collaboration of the co-creation. They see things I don't see, my, my cohort, the others in my cohort. I see things that they don't see. We disagree on things, but we don't emphasize that. We emphasize the things that we agree on, and then we understand what each is trying to do to make a difference in the world, and we come together and, and do that together. Yeah, and in that way, I think collaboration or co-creation is also helpful in bridging differences. We don't have to, to agree on everything. It's a great way to put it. You're exactly right. Bridging differences. So if I were to meet, if I were to meet um, these other 25 people in my cohort, and they are pastors of, of uh, Baptist and Lutheran and Greek Orthodox and Catholic and Salvation Army, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is me. Um, Presbyterian, Anglican, all these different denominations. There's, there's some gaps. There would be gaps in what we believe. And what you said, Sandra, is exactly right. We bridge those gaps by, by looking at, at what we, we're focusing on, what we can agree on, but by collaborating, by co-creating. We just love each other. We're here to support each other despite differences. So I think that's a great way to put it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it came to my mind. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about art as well. I mean, you're oh, a yes. business mentor and a theologist, but you're also a great artist. And for me, art and artists are so important yes. because uh, they help us to see the beauty in things that seem ugly. And, they, and art helps us to think big. 
yes. and to get creative. I mean, it's so important. Um, and I know that you utilize your art for positive transformation as well. Yes. How do you do that? Um, first of all, whenever I go to a city, so I've over 40 years in business, traveled all around the United States and Canada and Australia and Egypt and, 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 and uh, other places. And you'll come to the Netherlands. So. I, I, haven't, I haven't been to the Netherlands, but I've been to Ireland and England. And it's kind of the, that direction anyway, right? Yeah. But um, whenever and wherever I go, Sandra, I, before I go, I look up, okay, where are the art museums? Because I, I, that is, that's a highlight, a highlight. When I was in Egypt, art, Ireland, I went to the National Gallery in Dublin. You know, when I was in England, it was National Gallery. Oh, my gosh, spectacular works, right? They're inspiring to see the work of Da Vinci. Yes, they call it a cartoon, which is a drawing um, of the first family. Or no, no, the Holy Family is what it's called. <laughs> uh, to see that in person, it was like, oh, my goodness, Rembrandt and all these other Oh, my goodness. You're right. It's inspiring. And that's why you go into people's homes. Most homes have some art because it's inspiring. And sometimes we don't even know why we're inspired by a piece of art, but, but we are. I don't know why I love that art, but boy, it inspires me. It makes me feel good, right? So uh, years ago, I discovered in my own art uh, these, these uh, like I'm an art whisperer. It's like the art speaking to me <laughs> almost, you know? So I started to look at art differently not just i love the color and i love the way that this you know the the uh the uh the size or or whatever it was or the 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 image in the painting whatever it is it was like um what is this what am i learning from this piece of art what what is it what what is it teaching or what can it teach i started looking through the lens of what is this painting teaching me So it was actually this Muhammad Ali painting. For example, I painted the Muhammad Ali painting and I'm looking at Muhammad. I'm looking in his eyes. I'm, what, is, what did I learn from this? And then I went online and I looked at his quotes and I said, man, that's what this is teaching me. I am the greatest. I said that before I knew I was. And then I wrote a whole chapter about that, about, about the importance of, of Of, of looking at and, and, and understanding what the greatness that is within us. Sometimes we don't see it at first, but boy, there's, a, there's some wonderful things within us that we haven't been able to tap into. So each of my, I wrote a book. It would be really helpful if I had it here to show you. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I'm going to get it. Yeah, I just get it. That's okay. No We're curious. We'll wait. <laughs> So it's easier to show you. See how well prepared I am for this interview? Yeah, you have it handy. <laughs> Totality X, the art of becoming all God created you to be. So let me just show you, for example. Oh, here's a Van Gogh. Here's a Van Gogh, right? Yeah. So I painted this. Let me, let me just give you an example. I painted this, this painting of Van Gogh. It's a copy of a Van Gogh, right? And I looked at that and... And the, the title of the painting that was given after Van Gogh died, so this isn't the, the title that he gave it, from my understanding, but it was given Grieving Old Man or At Heaven's Gate, like he's about to die. When I painted that, Sandra, you know what came to my mind was gratitude, the gratitude principle. So here is an old man. And he's by the fire and I see, and he's, he's crying in gratitude. I, I have this home. I have this warm fire. I have a family that loves me. I, I'm making a difference. I'm able to do. So this whole chapter is about gratitude. Mm, and, and then there's other, I can, I like this one. This one is, this is the Beatles. Um, it was painted onto a wooden stump. And uh, I, I was at a, a, a campfire with a bunch of friends from church, and I'm about to put this big wood stump on the, the campfire to give it some fuel. 
And I looked at that stump and I said, wait a second. I said, I could turn this into a piece of art. That was seconds away from being dust for the rest of, <laughs> of eternity. Instead, I brought it to my studio and I painted the Beatles onto it. So you can't see this really well, but John Lennon and McCartney and Ringo Starr and, and George mm -hmm. Harrison. And then on top, I put the Beatles, um, Beatles uh, Green Apple label, right? Now, here's the thing. What did, what did I learn from that? First of all, it's the rescued principle. So I rescued it from the fire. But there was something else that I learned from this as I was painting that. I got, I did John Lennon and then I was working on Paul McCartney and then I was working on Ringo Starr. And it was when I got to Ringo Starr that I saw that there's a crack right down the middle of his nose on my, on this piece. Then I started to look at the wood and I said, oh my gosh, there's blemishes everywhere. There's cracks everywhere. And then I did the, um, the, the George Harrison part and there's cracks all over that one as well. And I started to wonder Gosh, is this a failure? Is this painting ugly because it's got all these cracks and blemishes? <clears throat> what did I learn? So I looked at it from the lens of, okay, what is good? What can I learn from this? And I realized, I realized that the cracks and the blemishes make that piece of art spectacular. It made it more one of a kind. You can't find anything like this in the world. So the cracks and the blemishes, then I apply that to us. I've got cracks. I've got the wrinkles. You know, I've got the gray. I've got the hair loss. I've got all these cracks. That makes me more one of a kind. It's like the blemishes, the cracks, the imperfections. I call it the, per the perfect imperfection principle. It's like our imperfections make us beautiful it makes us remarkable so so every single piece of art so there's 16 pieces of art in here i've created there i've created a lot of others it's like um um this one i i showed you this earlier but but here's dave right so yeah, I, did there whole, is. <laughs> I did a whole chapter so what's the title of this one i think i told you before but it's the van gogh portrait principle what i what i wrote about here i'll be real brief but since we're talking dutch <laughs> uh, Van Gogh. There were times where people, somebody really annoyed me. I was at the airport one day and everybody was annoying me. I was probably tired. And everybody was annoying me. And then it hit me. And it seems this sounds kind of crazy. But I start, I was looking at a particular person that was annoying. And I thought, if Van Gogh painted his picture, <laughs> I would think that this guy's the coolest guy in the world. Wow, Van Gogh painted your picture. I know you from Van Gogh's portrait. Oh my gosh, that is so cool. I get to meet you in person. That sounds kind of silly and ridiculous, but it changed the way I felt about that person. And then I started looking, if Van Gogh painted a painting of her, what would it look like? And then I would admire her, you know? It's like, a, um, uh, Madame, I think uh, Roland, Roland, he painted uh, Madame Roland. I, you, would, you would pronounce it differently than me, but um, she's just someone who posed for a portrait for Van Gogh, right? I mean, she was just a friend, Madame Roden, I think that's the name. And, and, but now she's world famous. Yeah. And she appeared somewhere, Sandra. <laughs> this is the one, Mrs. Madam uh, Ro Roland. There she Roland. is. Yeah. There she is. It's like, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so nice to meet you in person. She's just an ordinary person. But so, anyway, um, all, all sorts of things like that. And I've painted a lot of pictures, um, paintings since that time. So, that's what I like to do. I like to try to find what is it in the painting? What is it teaching me? What is the principle that I can apply to, um, to help people become all that they're capable of becoming? And, oh, here it is. It's, um, let me see if I can find her name. Oh, Madame Genot, I'm sorry. <laughs> she Genot, oh, she, she must be French then. She's French, because yeah. it was in A-R-E-L-S. Arles. Yeah. Arle, can you say it? Arle. 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 Yeah. So, it, so imagine he painted her and then you meet her in person. So that's the principle. 
So what I, you know, I have here the art, it's called the art of becoming all God created you to be. Not everything is in here as to how, but here's some art that teaches some principles that you can apply that makes your life better, helps you on that path to becoming total. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's so special how you do that, how you you find the beauty and the lessons in art and then you articulate it and you use the art also to show us in a picture what you're talking about. Yes. So it's it's that combination of life lessons and art. I, th I think it's an art in itself, the way you do, do it, the way you put it in your books and the way you put it in your articles. I love your articles. I Thank eat them. You. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And I, I do the same thing in a podcast. My podcast is Totalityism. And um, so I take I take these same paintings and I talk about them and kind of do the same thing there as well. And on your YouTube channel as well, I saw some videos. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I pay attention. And, and it doesn't even have to be just my art, which majority of what I do is my art. But it's like, go to the Louvre. You would pronounce it differently because you know how to speak French. But <laughs> go to the Louvre and there's the Mona Lisa. This, again, this might sound ridiculous, but we <laughs> are standing there millions of people a year to see this. It's a, it's a small piece of poplar wood. Yeah, with, it's very small, yeah. With some paint on it. Now, we love that, admire it, because Leonardo da Vinci painted it, one of a kind, and it's beautiful, right? Beautifully done, one of the greatest artists ever. But it's a piece of wood with some paint on it. And we're, we're all standing there, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people at a time standing there. The person standing right next to you is a more beautiful, remarkable piece of art than the Mona Lisa is. This person is, and this is the way I put it, this is where I bring theology. And this person's a child of God, not created by a great artist, the greatest artist. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I teach that and I share that, Sandra, because it's like um, there, there's a good principle. Love people, treat people well. So the, the Van Gogh portrait principle, frame it differently, see people differently. Mm -hmm. and, and in that same chapter, I talk about, Um, you know, the Mona Lisa, how funny that is, that when you think about it, how we're just bumping into people, get out of my way, I want to get a better look at this piece of wood with paint on it, you know, <laughs> I don't want, to, don't want to diminish the value, right? But no, 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 it's beautiful. I'm exaggerating the point, like, get, get out of my way so I can see this when, mm -hmm. wait a second, look at this little gal from Italy, Look at this little gal from the Netherlands. They're beautiful. They're remarkable. They're, they've been created by somebody greater than Da Vinci. So that's, <laughs> that's my point. <laughs> well, I, I did see the Mona Lisa and I had a hard time finding it because it's so small and all those people around. Wow. I walked by, I didn't find it. And then I thought, ah, okay, it must be behind those people. There. <laughs> so then I had to shuffle in yeah. and then finally I... <laughs> Good to have a look. Yeah. Uh, about another lovely son of God. I mean, what Joe did. Joe, he bought a city, a mining city. Oh, yes. Uh, he bought Cleto together with some friends, and now he's the mayor. Yeah. What do you think about that? So Joe Polish, a year ago, it was actually a year ago in November, he's up in Utah, Thanksgiving. We go out. And he says, I'm, I'm buying a town, a ghost town. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, really? <laughs> so, so he showed me pictures. And, I thought, and it immediately went right here. It's like, that is the coolest thing ever. So I go online and there was this video from the realtor, the person who was selling it. It's 39 acres, as I recall, for about a million dollars, right? And so I watch this video And it's like a cowboy town. There's a there's a bar and a and a and a general store and eight people that live there. Yeah, and a yacht club. And a yacht club. Thank you and for no water me. around. <laughs> Not a drop of water within <laughs> miles, but it's a yacht club. So they've got this old boat, and they've got some other you know uh, vessels you know there, 
And so anyway, I'm thinking, this is so dang cool. So Joe and his partners closed on it in January. And I live in Utah, about 10 hours away from Cleeter, right? But my son and his wife and kids live in Flagstaff, a couple of hours from Cleeter. So we went down to visit my family, our kids, and, and then met Joe. I met Joe and a couple of his partners in Cleeter. So I drove there. It's good to have a four-wheel drive vehicle because it's kind of tough to get there. Cleeter is kind of on the way to, I don't remember the, the name of the city or the, the town. It's not a city, a little town that's up mm-hmm. high that a lot of people go to to, to do four-wheeling, you know, off-road stuff, motorcycles. So they have to go through Cleeter to get there. So it gets a little bit of traffic. Right. That's why there's a bar there and the bar can actually make some money. But anyway, I go there and I spent hours with Joe and Jason and Mike, his a couple of his partners. I just fell in love with the place. Center. It was like, this is so dang cool. <laughs> and I, I, I went back. My wife wasn't with me to clean her, but I went back to, to my son's house and I said, OK, this place is the coolest place ever. Oh, my gosh. So many possibilities, which I'll talk about in a second. And she goes online and she looks at pictures and stuff and she comes back to me and she looks at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> so that place is so ugly. It's so desolate. Now, she's right. But it's kind of like you looking at a you know hopeless to hot spot. Yeah, you see the potential. Yeah, she was looking. She didn't see the potential. But Joan is his partners. They're brilliant marketers. They're brilliant developers. So it's like what you were talking about earlier in terms of collaboration and co-creation. Joe is this incredible visionary. He's an remarkable marketer. He's connected with all of these people. Um, and then you've got Jason, who has different skills. You've got Mike, who's got different. Mike and Jason, they've developed resorts. You know, they've built resorts. They've made man-made lakes, all sorts of. So they each are bringing in these different skills so that so that they can get this done. So they're putting it on, like Joe developed a, a virtual reality company. Well, he's going to put Cleeter into virtual reality. Um, uh, on the metaverse, uh, they did an NFT, non-fungible token, um, and they raised, I think, nearly $400,000 selling a, I think it's like a 20-second video, and I was there, of us walking in Cleeter. So that's an NFT. I saw it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so one of those is me. I'm the, I'm the guy that's uh, kind of in the back in that video. But anyway. <laughs> You're in it. <laughs> I'm in it. So um, and then and then turning it into a really cool place, like a retreat center, they can have meetings there. They've got the the building that is the best there is the old schoolhouse. It was made really, really well. But I went in there and there's, you know, we're talking about uh, uh, pigeons. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gross. It's disgusting. And they gave me a chair and a desk out of there that I have in my studio right here in my gallery. It, it, it's framing my art. Um, so they're, 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 they're turning that, they can turn that into a, a, a retreat center or a place. They're talking about turning that into a restaurant, all sorts of possibilities. And I think the eight residents, because they don't pay much for the homes there. They pay hundred dollars a month, you know, to, to have his little, little homes. And um, so it's like, wow, these guys are coming in. I'm sure I'm getting kicked out. No, Joe and his partners is like, we want you here. We want to, we want to make you part of this. You know, it's like, because they're, they're such unique personalities, the people that have lived there for 20 years, you can imagine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, and they, they want that to be part of it. There's what well, friend of Joe's who does comic books. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, very, very, and I can't think of what it is, but I mean, a high end comic books and, and this guy saying, well, we can put Cleeter in the comic books and turn it into kind of like a, 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 a big, a big, a big thing in the comic books. And so just, just, I think when they bought it, it was like, I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to do it anyway. I mean, they have the, the, you know, the different visions, but it's just it's a, it's it's exciting. It's really interesting. So Joe is the is, is that why he bought it? I mean, I mean, what comes to mind is why did he buy it? 
Well, you know, so the reason that, so um, Jason Campbell, he sent him a link to the video, this ghost town is for sale. And uh, Jason was kind of just joking around like, Hey, want to buy a town? (laughs) So they were looking at it. Like if, if we needed to get out of town, someplace off the grid, you know, there's some sort of uh, uh, catastrophe, boy, we could just go there and, and we're, we're safer. Right. So that was their original thinking. And then it turned into, wow, we could do some really cool stuff. Joe has a, a nonprofit called Genius Recovery. He helps addicts. Yeah. And, and so he calls Cleeter. He says, this is going to be a great place of healing. So healing for addicts and um, art. He wants to bring in art and all sorts of, of of really interesting things. So I think it's still evolving. They're doing some infrastructure, you know, with the water and probably sanitation, stuff like that. They're making some expensive improvements to the place. But then from there, it's like the sky's the limit. I I have a feeling that they have too many ideas. Mm -hmm. You got to bring it down and say, okay, this is what we're, and they probably already have. I haven't talked to them about it for a while, but it's probably, okay, here's the direction. I'm sure they're very clear on the direction, but there's, there's so many possible. (laughs) But that's the beauty of being busy with a town. You can do so many things. But they, they need your help, Sandra. They need your help. <laughs> and I mean, why do they need my help then? Why do you think? You're, you're such a, well, you take, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it, it's not a hot spot. It's not a hot spot no, at all. No, yeah. And, and so, you know, for you to turn it into, you know, it, it, most people would say it's hopeless. Like, what the heck are you guys doing? This is like, this doesn't make any sense, but you can help them turn it into a hot spot. And, um, because you've been there and done that. They have. Yeah, yeah that's that's true. I've done that. And uh, we did with that in the Netherlands a lot. Yeah. Because we live uh, with a lot of people on a very small country. And we have to rethink and rediscover and reuse a lot of city areas and buildings. And I think that the Netherlands is one of the, the biggest in reuse. Mm. We have the biggest experience and we have so many people with expertise in that field. Yeah, Yeah. that's beautiful. So I will tell you something. This is what Joe, something Joe is doing with it. So I visited the end of January. I told you that I went to that barn and found Mm -hmm. that 1947 truck. I convinced the owner over a period of time to sell it. But then I hesitated. It's like, well, you know. I'll get it eventually. And the owner was very patient. Oh, it's in the barn. It's not going anywhere when you're ready to buy it. And I was in no hurry. And then Joe and his partners bought Cleeter. (laughs) Within a week, there was someone else who was looking at it, but didn't didn't pull the trigger, uh, so to speak, Didn't, didn't buy it. And so Joe and his partners bought it. And this other person, oh, my gosh, it got sold. I wanted to buy it, but I procrastinated. And I think Joe and his partners bought it for about a million. Like a week later, somebody else came and said, hey, I was looking at it as well. I didn't do it. I procrastinated. I want to buy it from you. I'll give you one point. $2.5 Two five million dollars, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars more than you bought it for mm-hmm. a week ago. Yeah, a week later. And Joe and his partner said, "No, no, we we didn't buy this to flip it. We bought this, you know, because we're going to do some big things." And when I heard that, and I went to Cleeter, when I when my wife and I were driving home from Arizona to Utah, I said, "Kay, my Cleeter is that nineteen forty seven truck." I said, I want to do to that truck, for that truck, what Joe and his partners are doing with Cleeter. Um, And if I procrastinate like others did with Cleeter, I'm going to miss out on this. So as soon as we got home, I contacted the owner an hour away in Heber. I said, I'm coming on Friday. Is it okay if I come on Friday? I want to buy the truck. And uh, so my wife and I went up, we bought the truck, we had it towed and fixed and the rest is history. But I call that truck my cleater. It's my cleater. And uh, excuse me for just one second. <laughs> I'm going to show you something here. I'm curious what you're going to get. Well, so 
So the truck is my cleater. And, and so what it represents is what in your life, and then Joe's taken that, he's made it into a, a genius network thinking tool. What's your cleater? So it could mean, what are you procrastinating doing? What should you pull the trigger on that you have not pulled the trigger on yet? And or what are the hidden possibilities within your business? Uh, what are the hidden possibilities? What is it? How can you and put it in your language? How can you take um, something that is hopeless and turn it into a hot spot in your life? So Joe calls it, what is your cleater? You, if you had a tool, you would call it. Um, hopeless to hotspot. What in your life is hopeless? Seems hopeless. Is it your relationship with a with a teenage child? Is it your marriage relationship? Is it your business? What seems hopeless? And what does hotspot look like? And then, so when you can start envisioning that, you know, I'm the greatest. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Who I was. Here's the hotspot, and that I'm going to have that. I'm going to own that. So the thing is with this truck. It's so so it's like I didn't want it represented procrastinating and I didn't want to miss out. So that's why I bought it. But since that time, I, I, we were talking, I drove it in a parade. Um, I have used it to frame my art. So in the back of the truck, I've put the Beatles sculpture, you know, that that painting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the wooden one. Yeah. Yeah. So I've taken pictures against the mountains in the background and the lake. This is right near where my home is. And then the truck with the with the 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 desk from Cleeter with the Beatles on top of that. I've taken pictures. So so it's like I'm using the truck to frame my art, but then the truck becomes art. So this is what I want to share. This is a painting I did of the truck. Yes. Yeah. It's a you know abstract painting, all of this. But this is like that's what the truck looks like. It's a green truck. And so it my cleater. Where's the opportunity within this mess? Where is, where's the, where uh, again is, or what is your cleater in your life? So Joe is, um, you know, he's, he's, he's asking that question. He's collecting answers from people. What's your cleater? He's got a website. He's doing different things with it. So um, sometimes we get something. We get a ghost town. Not that we do that. Or we get a truck, a 75-year-old truck, and we, we have a particular vision for it. And then it's just bigger. It's bigger than what we originally intended. Yeah. And what I want to tell you is uh, you, you got a chair from uh, Cleaver and yep. you have it in your uh, gallery. Yeah, a little uh, table too. Uh -huh. Yeah, a table too. And when I heard it, I, I thought, ooh, it's good that you that you had it as a present, but still, I think it's a bit of a shame because uh, when people buy an old building or a ghost town, at first they don't see the value in it so much, yep. Yep. not in the details also. And a chair and and a table, those are the characteristic elements that you don't see the, the value of in the beginning, but after a year or maybe longer, you think, oh, wow. This piece of furniture, it really belongs here. Yep. Yeah, so he shouldn't give it all away. Don't give it all away. Just that. Just those. Yeah. That's it. Stop, yeah. Stop now. Stop giving stuff away after I got mine. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I also see that then when they are renovating and restoring buildings, uh, then the, the contractors come and they say, oh, they say to me, oh, little lady, we'll make it beautiful again. And this old wall with all the cracks and stuff, we'll make it uh, whole again. We put a, a white wall in front of it so you don't see the ugliness uh, behind it anymore. And then I say, are you mad? Yes, good <laughs> for you. Because I love that old wall. Yeah. It has so much more character. And it, that applies to the furniture as well. So... I just had to say that as a kind of free advice to Joe, where <laughs> if it comes to him, yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, it, it goes to that um, beetle sculpture with all the cracks and blemishes. Yeah. A, a person could come along and just fill in those, you know, and make it smooth. Oh, are you kidding me? So you're exactly right. When I go to an old hotel or something, 
like there's a, a hotel a couple hours away from us that we've been to. And it's a very old hotel from the 1800s. Those cracks in the wall, those types of things, it, it's beautiful. It, it tells a story, right? Now, it's a beautiful hotel, and it's clean and nicely decorated, but you have kind of an emerging of the old with the new, you know? So, no, I, I like your vision for that, absolutely. <laughs> and now I'm curious about one thing. Uh in the Netherlands and, and all through Europe, what we see is that many shops are closing because uh -huh. of online shopping and because of Corona also. Yep. And I wonder if that's also the case in the United States. Um, because here in the Netherlands, um, because those shops are closing, um, those beautiful inner city areas that we like to go to and to meet people and stuff, they become less, much less vivid and uh, they're not so lively anymore. And yeah. I just wondered, I don't, I don't know the United States that well. Is that something that is going on in the United States as well? Or it, it, I, I, so what I'll tell you is, um, so my wife and I, we, we like to go away uh regularly you know for three or four days weekends this and that to towns in utah and um there's a lot of vacancies a lot of businesses that, that have closed they're not there anymore and so i'm not an expert on that for the country but but i am in one way which i'll share with you in just a second so it's always sad to see that and and i you know certainly in my business uh, relationships. I hear people who struggle and how, you know, certain towns are, are, are hit harder than others. But, you know, I've been helping restaurant owners for the last almost 20 years. Um, there's a group that I help facilitate for restaurant owners mostly. And uh, when COVID hit, COVID hit, there were restaurants closing all over the country. Um, They, they had to because it's like people, you can't go, no, no, no dining. You couldn't go in person dining, dining. So, so what do you do? You know, you just have to close doors. I mean, it was, it was everywhere, you know, across the country, New York and big cities, small cities alike, but not with the group that I helped facilitate, which is a smaller group. There might be 55 members in it. Um, there were many in the group that I helped facilitate who actually did better during those months when and years when, when others were closing the doors. And here's why. They focused not on what they couldn't do. They focused on what they could do. So um, the government comes along, state, federal, you know, restaurants, you have to, you can't have any in-person dining. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do that. Okay, we're out of business because that's what our business is. The simple low-hanging fruit answer would be, well, we've never done takeout, but we're going to do takeout because that's something that we can do. And then the laws in California started, they changed where people could take out alcohol from a restaurant. You can't do it in normal times, but that was something that they allowed them to do in California. So, okay, uh, we're going to do, you can take out these, these drinks, right? So a friend of mine, he's in this group, his name is Bent Hansen, a Norwegian fellow. He owns a, a restaurant in, in uh, Pasadena, near LA, Los Angeles, near the Rose Bowl. He's got a, a restaurant called Los Gringos Locos. In Spanish, that means the crazy white guys, I think. <laughs> right? um, anyway, Los Gringos Locos. And he focused on what can I do? What can I do? What, what, are, the, what are the little loopholes? Where, what can I do? So you couldn't have in-person, in-house in dining. So he rented tents, like a circus tent, and put it in the, the parking lot. So that, that was considered outdoor dining. Really? So, so he moved it there. Now, it wasn't convenient. You had to, there wasn't a kitchen there. They had to bring it up. And then between his building and the building next to him in this shopping area, it was an alleyway. 
And he turned that into, what did he call it? A fresco or something like that. Just little, nice little tables. It looked like a little Mexican, a little Mexican town that was outside. And then he had an alley behind his, his uh, restaurant. And he would send out an email. Now he had a list of customers. He was smart. He had a list. People would be part of his loyalty program. Mm -hmm. So they gave it emails and stuff because they get free free meals on their birthday, things like that. So he sent out emails and said, um, on Wednesdays from four o'clock until seven o'clock, there's a pre-packaged meal and it is chicken and this and that. Just come in the back alley and it's $75. It'll feed a family of four, whatever. They would sell out of that every week. They'd sell a lot of those every week. So the big tent in front, (laughs) <laughs> little fresco in between yeah. and then it rally behind. And then he started doing these Zoom sessions like you and I are doing a Zoom session. It was uh, called uh, something about tequila. It was like, <laughs> so, so people would pay, I don't remember, $75 to get a tequila kit sent to them. And then they would join the Zoom call. And then there would be an expert on how to make tequilas. And they'd mm-hmm. all come together virtually and make these to everything everything that he was doing his business actually increased yeah. when others across the street sandra were closed because they focused on what they could not do, not do yeah as opposed to what they could do so yeah restaurants have struggled a lot except those who have the attitude that I've just described. Yeah, I love it. You describe the attitude of uh, crisis makes creative. When I mean, you're able to do that. I like it. Yep, that's a great way to put it. Uh, it's a great way. So, so crisis comes along and there's opportunity. Yeah. And and it depends on what you're focusing on. Again, you know, with my art, I focus on art. And it's like, what is this teaching me? What is it? What are the principles? What can I share? How can I help people become better? Uh, even all that God created them to be. Here's art. How can I, how can that art help create unity, friendship, and love between all races and faith groups? That's my focus. There's crisis. Where's my focus? Where's the opportunity? Yeah. Napoleon Hill, who wrote the book, Think and Grow Rich. He said, in every adversity, every problem, every challenge, not most of them, he said, every has a seed for an equivalent or greater benefit. There's crisis. Where's the seed? What's the seed for an equivalent or greater benefit? And so it's a great way to to think and to, to, to live. You know, there's crisis in your family, marital crisis, raising teenage crisis. Where's the opportunity? Where is it? Where's that seed that that will actually make our family a better family, a more loving family? Where is it? I don't know where it is. You got to find it, right? Uh, I love it so much. I mean, you put it so well. Thank you so much, Timothy. I enjoyed this. My pleasure, Sandra. Oh. Pleasure. <laughs> you and I used to spend at least three, sometimes four sessions like this a month with the group. Yeah. And it's been seven months since we've seen each other. Yeah, this we miss like each a, other. It's like a reunion. It is. It is. It is. We miss each other. And I think we could be talking for hours. <laughs> We could we could go on and on and on. People would start to turn out, tune out a little bit after they Maybe. heard yeah. too much more. But anyway, yeah, it, uh, it, we yeah. enjoyed it. <laughs> no, yes. I think I think there are so many wonderful lessons that can be drawn from this podcast. And I thank you so very much, Timothy. I love every minute of it. My pleasure, Sandra. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> you're so welcome. Well, I'll close the podcast now. eh? We reached the end of the podcast episode. And of course, I'm curious now about the insights that you, our listeners and viewers, have gained. It would be great if you share it in a comment on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. We'd really love to hear from you. Right, Timothy? Yes. Yeah. (laughs) I'd love to hear that. 
Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Timothy, very much for your inspiring words. And to our viewer and listener, thank you for your interest. We really hope that it helped you. And in four weeks' time, there will be a new pod podcast episode ready for you. In the meantime, of course, I will share, share all kinds of tips and tricks and new developments with you by social media. So I see you next time. Stay tuned. Oh,